sorry folks oh. yeah started sorry go ahead go ahead yeah okay so uh, what happens as the uh, now if there are some 10000 or 20 or any features right we cannot visualize it if we cannot visualize we cannot go for proper analysis of that so in that case if we reduce that to two dimensional or three dimensional it will be very easy for our analysis also okay that is one more thing if there are more dimensions it is very difficult to visualize and further it is difficult for analysis that is one more thing and the other thing is see as we keep on increasing features right what happens it's not like all the features are required for our analysis only few features are sufficient to uh, i mean to analyze something or to predict something okay so in that case what happens is suddenly like uh, i mean the accuracy also keeps on decreasing till certain point it increases and after that if we add the features which are not required right then it decreases for example if we are trying to uh, predict uh, price of house okay so uh, let's say what happens uh, when we i mean mostly in india what we look at the bhk uh, how many bhk it is there uh, and after that if kitchen is available and uh, Uh, what is that garden is there i mean we don't use any fireplace and all right in india so that is not required but maybe in some other country yes it is required but for us it is not required because we don't consider that because we don't use that so if we add th that uh, that feature right what happens the accuracy starts decreasing okay so these are the issues if we have more dimensions so uh, what we do that is nothing but curse of dimensionality okay i'll i'll stop here so that uh, i'll stop you here and i'll i'll take i'll take over for a few minutes with respect to understanding the curse of dimensionality mm -hmm. i'll pose certain questions so not to you but to the audience uh, so think of a hypothetical situation so you have students from the state of tamil nadu who gave their uh, class 12 exams and uh, you have people scoring in various subjects from say 40 i don't know what's the pass mark let's say it's 40 all the way up to 100 and of course each student would have scores in various subjects evidently now let's say the objective here is to classify you pick 1000 out of that lot some of you manage to identify 1000 people out of the lot and you bucket them into a bunch of categories the first category being very poor poor then average then good and then very good something like that all right and the way you do that is you compress their scores so of course as i said they've all passed so which means they've scored more than 40 i don't know what the pass mark is but let's say it's 40 so you you compress that score their scores from 40 to 100 into a scale of 0 to 1 let's say so everybody's score in a particular subject is is scaled within 0 to 1 so somebody who scores 40 would get a scaled score of 0 and somebody who scores 100 gets a scaled score of 1 all right so i would have a math score of say 9.2 something like that maybe an english score of say 4.3 something like that all right i'm sorry not 4.3 0.43 because it's from 0 to 1 so my math score would be 0.93 my english score could be say 0.43 something like that so all scores are compressed within 0 to 1 or are the scaled in that range now now you you sit together as a team and then try to figure out how you have 1000 people and you want to you want to fit those 1000 people into these bunch of categories as i said you know you start with very poor 
And let's say you come up with this following rule. The rule is as follows. Anybody whose scaled score in mathematics, I'll go again. Anybody whose scaled score in mathematics is between 0 to 0 0.2 shall be categorized as very poor. All right. Anybody whose scaled score in mathematics is from 0 to 0 0.2 shall be categorized as very poor. Now, assuming that people's scores are well distributed, equally distributed across the spectrum. So from 0 to 1, it's like uniformly distributed, let's say. So can you tell me, out of 1,000 people, approximately how many would fall under the 0 to 0 0.2 bucket? Anybody? You have 1,000 people here. We're saying that their scores in math is uniformly distributed across the scaled range of 0 to 1. And, and what we're trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out those whose scores are between 0 to 0 0.2. So how many approximately? Yeah, 200. That's right. Sandhya is right. So approximately 200 because we say we are... What are we saying here? It's uniformly distributed, right? So 1,000 people's scores are uniformly distributed. So if you if you look for scores between 0 to 0 0.2, then don't you see that approximately, you know, you'll find 200 people within that range, right? Now, that was just math. Now, someone else comes and says, look, you just can't go by math scores to decide whether a student is a poor student or a very poor student or a good student or an excellent student. Let's pick English scores as well. All right. So now the rule is as follows. Anybody whose math scores is between 0 to 0 0.2 and English scores is between 0 to 0 0.2 will be categorized as very poor, all right? Now, assuming as a student, my ability to score in math is independent of my ability to score in English, which means I can be stellar in mathematics, but I can be very poor in English. I can be stellar when it comes to English, but I can be very poor in mathematics. Let us say that's how we're all wired. Let's say that's how our brains are wired, unfortunately. Let's say. Now tell me, now I have two dimensions. The math dimension and then the English dimension. Now can you tell me approximately how many out of the thousand would fit into the 0 to 0 0.2 range? Anybody? Remember now there are two dimensions. When there was one dimension, it was 200 because it was very simple. You had 1,000 people. You distributed them equally across. I mean, you, you distributed them equally from 0 to 1, and you're looking at the number of people who fit into 0 to 0 0.2 range. But now you have two dimensions. How many would fit in? Anyone? Have enough. 400. Ah, okay. This is the mistake that people commit. Okay, let me ask a question. No, Sandhya, it's not 100. We'll, we'll come to that. No, Why? Not everyone will satisfy both the condition at the same time. Sorry, I said it's independent, right? Yes, so we cannot decide on, like... Assume that it's independent. Will... Assume it's independent. Which means my ability to score. And uh, okay, assume it's independent and also assume that the scores are equally distributed. So, which means English scores are equally just dis uniformly distributed from 0 to 1. Math scores are uniformly distributed from 0 to 1. But 
they are independent, which means somebody can have a stellar score in mathematics and yet maybe poor scores in English, maybe better, good scores, maybe excellent scores. It doesn't really matter. They're not related at all. Okay. Given that, my question is, how many would you find within the 0 to 0 0.2 range? Now, I'll come to Abhinav now, because since Abhinav said 400, Abhinav, I'm going to ask a question now. I roll a die, and I look for one. How many cases would I see when I roll one die? One by six. One. Okay, one out of six, right? I roll it twice, and I look for one, one. How many so, cases would I see? Would I see would I see two by six? No, no, one by thirty six. One by thirty six. So what why one by thirty six? So because we are the independent the exactly. Body. They're independent. So what do you do in that case? You you don't add multiply. you multiply. Multiply the both of them. Oh. Exactly. So in this case, as I said, which is why I picked up English. I said the my ability or rather a, a student's ability to score in math does not, I mean, is independent of his or her ability to score in English. So that being the case, you have two dimensions and we're looking for the number of, yeah, it is intersection. You're right, Sunduja. Yes, you're right. But if you know some basic probability, then the probability of both of them happening simultaneously, where people scoring from 0 to 0 0.2 in math and scoring between 0 to 0 0.2 in English would be 0.2 into 0.2. So that will be 0 0.04. Right? So it will be 40. Right? Why? Because you have 1,000 people and the probability of somebody scoring between 0 to 0 0.2 in both math and English is 0.2 into 0.2, so 0 0.04. All right, so you'll find 40 people. Now, let me add one more dimension. Tamil, entirely independent dimension now. Why? I can have a super score in math. I can have a pathetic score in Tamil. Likewise, I can have a fantastic score in English. I can have a pathetic score in Tamil. Maybe I'll have a good score too. So I've introduced another dimension, the third dimension. And I'm going to ask the same problem again. Assuming that a student's ability to score in math is independent from his or her ability to score in English, is independent of his or her ability to score in Tamil, then out of the 1,000 people, how many would you find who have scored between 0 to 0 0.2 in math, English, as well as Tamar? Eight. Eight, exactly. Why? It's simple. 0 0.2 into 0 0.2 into 0 0.2, which is 0 0.008. So 1,000 multiplied by 0 0.008 is 8. Now, let's, let's see. The objective here is not to teach you the math here. But look at what is happening. The more dimension I increase, then I mean, as I keep increasing the dimensions here and assuming that they're independent, just for the sake of discussion, look at the kind of data points I get. When there was one dimension, I had 200 people to fit. Now, as I keep increasing the dimensions, I don't have data points to fit at all. Now, just imagine if there are 10 independent subjects, right? We just took three as an example here, but let's say there are 10. Now, some okay, let's let's do this. Somebody says, let's add physics to the list. We all know when you add physics to the list, we generally know that somebody who scores well in math will also score well in physics. But let's say they are independent. You add chemistry to the list, assuming they're independent. You can keep adding, right? So what will happen is the more dimensions you add, and if you try to look for data within this multidimensional space, 
you will not get data at all that satisfies a criteria isn't it don't you see that because you you had 1000 people and you started looking for people who 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 are poor scorers in math in english in tamil in in say biology in say chemistry in physics you're not going to get people at all and if you're not going to get people or in this case you're not going to get data how are you going to do any meaningful analysis you cannot right which is which is what is called as the curse of dimensionality in the sense we all think the more dimensions we have the better it is for us right so wh why do we say that because we think okay there is a problem there are so many factors that influence the outcome of a problem if i have all the factors with me then i can say with clarity that such and such i mean uh, you know this is the outcome a, go a good example is let's say let's say whether a certain person will get uh, a compensation greater than 10 lakhs in campus placements let's say that's what you're trying to predict now you can you'll probably come up with 10 factors you'll probably come up with cgpa could be one one factor maybe whether their ability to speak in english could be another factor maybe their ability to do competitive coding could be another factor you you come with you know 10 different parameters and then when you try to model and you try to fit in people you'll find probably nobody who will fit into that model why because if you want people who who are simultaneously at the same point in time you know fantastic uh, i mean who are fantastic grades plus who who can uh, converse in english who who are very good at competitive coding all those factors put together you're not going to get people at all so so while framing the problem you might think that the more dimensions you have the better it is but the fact is when you start doing your analysis when you start fitting the data into your world of you know into this multi dimensional world you'll find that there's nobody who fits into that world which is what we say is the curse of dimensionality so the what are the key objectives of pca which is uh principal component analysis is to reduce the dimension so i'll i'll give an example what I, what we mean by reduce the dimensions so as i said we start with math then we move to english now somebody says let's add physics so you added physics to the dimension all right so now you have three dimensions maths english and then physics now intuitively think about it do you actually need physics as a separate dimension when you have math anyone so you're trying to figure out whether somebody is smart all right and 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 you look at the scores and then you look for okay you know the the category that we are focusing on is very poor so we're looking at three subjects math english and then physics all right my question is given that i have math do i need physics no you you wouldn't need it you can judge the person based on their math uh, sorry say that again you can judge the person based on their math because uh, physics is mostly math exactly so highly correlated isn't it correct so physics and math are highly correlated so typically people who score really well in math also score well in physics you will rarely have an instance where somebody scores exceptionally well in physics and fails in mathematics have you ever seen such a case never ever perhaps right they all go together maybe it, it can happen in a freak case with chemistry but never with physics so so if you think about it one thing that pca would do for us in this case is if you start with three dimensions math english and physics it will come back and say we don't need physics or it will do something between maths and physics it will come up with a new dimension which is very close to maths and physics and say look forget math and physics take this new dimension which is an amalgamation of math and physics something like that that's what pca will do for us 
All right. I'll stop here for questions before <coughs> uh, leaving the floor to Sirisha to continue. Any questions so far? All right. Oh, Sirisha, over to you. Yeah. So uh, now we have to reduce the dimensions. Okay. For that, we have two methods. One is feature selection. Feature selection means we will take only the important features which are required for our analysis. For example, again, house prediction. We want the size of the house and the number of, uh, I mean, washrooms we have or the garden which is available. Those are important features. And we will remove and we will not consider the fireplace at all. Okay. That is one thing. And uh, as uh, VC said, we have maths and physics, right? Since both are highly correlated, we can ignore either maths or physics. Okay, that is what is feature selection. We will take only important features, which will give very good information. The other one is dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction is nothing but feature extraction. Feature extraction means from the existing features, we will generate a new feature. These two are two different things. Feature selection is you will completely ignore the features which are not required. Dimensionality reduction or feature extraction means we will extract a new feature out of the existing features. Okay, let me stop here. I'll continue with the math physics example. So let's throw away physics for the time being. Let's introduce chemistry. All right, so you have math. You have English and then you have chemistry. So English is one feature, one dimension. It's independent. So it will stay. Right. Now, now you have math and chemistry. If you do feature selection, then you will decide whether to retain. Let's say eventually we want to work with only two dimensions, folks. Okay. Less number of dimensions, less the headache. So let's say we want to work with two dimensions. So feature selection would mean you either pick math or chemistry. You take a judgment call based on whatever, and then you choose, say, math. So eventually you say, I'll look at math and English to decide whether somebody is smart or not. Now somebody else might say, no, 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 I'll use chemistry in English to decide whether somebody is smart or not. Now what PCA would do for us is it will say, look, I will give you a new feature. And this feature would be an amalgamation of math and chemistry. Right? So, so the way it will look is, you'll have English. Let's say English stays as is. And then PCA would help you to come up with an entirely new feature which would be an amalgamation of math and chemistry. And effectively, you will still have only two features. One is, in this case, English. And the second is this amalgamated feature. You, you can call it by whatever name you want, okay? Technically, what it is, is it's a linear, com it will be a linear combination of math and chemistry. That's what it would be mathematically all right but it's a new feature that tca would tell you it's not something that the model designer would come up with it's something that pca will tell you that look this is a feature take it right so so which is where dimensionality reduction reduction through pca differs from feature selection where in feature selection, you drop a feature, but in dimensionality reduction using PCA, PCA gives you, it, it manages to extract features using the data, which is why PCA is very interesting. Any questions so far? To talk in machine learning terms, where does PCA fit in? We'll come to that, uh, Pradeep. This is machine learning, right? Dimensionality reduction is part of machine learning. Because you don't, 
you're, you're trying to learn. What are we trying to learn here? We're trying in this particular case. Uh, you know, we had this problem, right, where we're trying to fit people into these clusters. You know, the one cluster being very poor, the other one being poor, the next being good, so on and so forth, right? So our algorithm is supposed to fit people into, learn and fit people into these clusters. So what PC allows us to do is it allows us to meaningfully determine clusters based on features that you can extract using the data. That's what PCA does. Uh, over to you, Sirisha. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, I would like to highlight the differences between uh, feature selection and feature ex extraction. Okay. Now, the important thing of uh, dimensionality reduction is, as we already discussed, uh, there will be these three heads. One is, uh, I mean, prevent the curse of dimensionality. The other one is we can, performance of the model can be improved. And if we reduce to two dimensions, right, it will be easy for us to visualize. If we visualize, then we can understand and we can analyze the data. So that is what, uh, I mean, that is where we use this dimensionality reduction. Now, feature selection as, I mean, I'm just repeating it, that's all. It's a process of extracting important features to predict the output. Feature extraction is extracting new feature from the features which are already there. It is nothing but the linear combination. The new feature will be nothing but the linear combination of current features or the existing features. For example, in case of house, uh, I mean, again, house rate prediction, let's say uh, there are features like number of rooms, and size of rooms. After that, let's say we have some other dimensions, okay, uh, some other features. Now, if this number of feet, uh, number of rooms and size of room, if we multiply, we will get area of the flat, right? How will we calculate area of the house or flat? Number of rooms into size of rooms. I mean, number of room into size of room, we will add. Summation of all this will give the size of house, right? So instead of representing three rooms, each with 500 square feet, we can directly say 5, 1,500 square feet. Okay. So that will be extracted feature. Hmm. You're getting it, right? So instead of there, I have two features. Number of rooms and size of each room. Instead of that, together I have extracted a single feature with size of flat with fifteen hundred square feet. That is. Sirisha, the, is, the yeah. only my I have only I have one caveat there, and that being the extracted feature will be a linear combination. Yeah. Not a it, multiplicative. You. Let's be very clear. Yeah. You. The extracted feature will not multiply two existing features it will take only linear combinations yeah. so which means if you have number of rooms and if you have area per room the extracted feature will not multiply the two because this whole thing about pca is it only brings out linear combinations but yes in principle i understand what you're trying to say what you're trying to say is you have number of rooms you have uh Size area per room, room, size yeah, of each area. room. So you kind mm -hmm. of come up with a new feature that amalgamates the two. That's what you're attempting to say, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, fine. I get so it. that it will be easy to understand. Right. Okay. But actually, yes, the extracted feature will be linear combination of uh, the original features. That's okay. Fine. That is how the extracted feature will be. Okay, let me added. stop here. Folks, mm -hmm. anyone, not the usual suspects, what do we mean by linear combination? Anyone, not the usual suspects, not Sandhya, not Abhinav, not Kyle Vidi. I want someone else to say. What is linear? We keep using the word linear combination, linear combination. So if there is a feature F1, there's a feature F2. What is the linear combination of F1 and F2? What do we mean by that? So do I need to pick and choose somebody? 
vector multiplied uh, scalar multiplied vector on the argument of many like a1 v1 plus a2 v2 uh, till a and b n where a a1 a2 a3 and till a n are some scalars all right correct so in this case it's a scalar multiple of the feature added right so it's if there is feature f1 and f2 then i this new feature would be a scalar multiple of each feature so it's like three times f1 plus four times f2 that is what a linear combination is f1 into f2 that's not a linear combination that's multiplicative right so be, be very mindful of that okay so was that mugundan who answered just to be sure. Who was that? Yes. Sir. All right. Sure. Uh, Sirisha, go ahead. Okay. Now, I just wanted to show, I mean, using this diagram, what do we do in PCA? Or exactly like intuition actually behind PCA. Uh, we'll not go into depth of mathematics and all. Just to understand what exactly it does. So, for example, right here, I have my x axis and y axis x axis with size and y axis with no, number what are of we rooms. what are we no no what are we predicting here just just briefly tell us the problem statement let's start with the problem statement before you show us okay this diagram uh, yeah go ahead with the problem statement okay problem statement is i want to predict the price of the house using and... sorry Using what? What features? What features Using, do you have? Okay, features. I have two features. Number of rooms and size. All right. Okay. Okay. Go I ahead. have taken only these two features because it will be easy for us to understand. I want to show how we, we can, uh, I mean, uh, transform this two dimension into one dimension. After that, we can extend that for multiple dimensions. Okay. So now, if I plot the graph, right, between the size and number of rooms, these are the data points. If you see this, right, this orange color ones, these are the data points we have. Uh, the orange stars, is it? Yes. Okay. All right. Not the one on the line, right? That's a dot. No, no, no. Those are projections, actually. All right. So the, you're talking of the, mean, the, the, the crosses is yeah. the data point, correct? All correct. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I mean, crosses are not only here. They, they are here also. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Data is randomly distributed. I mean, we have here, here. There are multiple data points here, if you see. Okay. <laughs> now, PCA is nothing but, I mean, let's say, uh, one minute, I want to show one more diagram. Sorry, I think I don't. One Slide minute. seven, is it? Uh, I think I have put it somewhere. Or I removed it. No, I think. I don't have is it slide seven? Can you check? What seven, do you have on seven? Listen, no, no, no. Seven actually, I have uh, depicted something else. Okay, this all right. For PCA to identify PC one, one minute. That's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead with what you have. It's okay. Uh, no, no, no. I want to show the diagram, like how the projection looks. I think uh, one minute. PCA. Okay. Oh, this one this one if you see this diagram right you are able to see right like these are the data points here i have size here i have number of rooms okay now if i want to uh, i mean now i'm working on dimensionality reduction i want to uh, what is this project this two dimensional to one dimension in that case let's say i have projected these points onto this size axis so in that case what happens all the points will come here Okay, and my two dimension is converted into one dimension. And I have the information about size distributed here. If I project all these points here, if you see this orange line, right? This gives the spread of data or variance of the data. So from here, I can depict size. But the problem is, if we project like this, if you see this, right? The number of rooms will come here, will come down to origin here. And we will not have information about number of rooms. We will lose this information about number of rooms if I project directly the points onto the corresponding uh, axis. You're getting it? Similarly, if I project this side, I will lose size information. But if I project this side, I will lose number of rooms information. 
okay so i don't want to lose any information okay i want all the information for my analysis so in this case what i will do is we will consider a line okay which has maximum coverage or maximum information of all the data so in this case right i will take this line if i take this line what happens it has i mean i and i will project these data points onto here so what happens i have all the information or the variance or the spread of data related to size here okay along with that what i do is i will draw a perpendicular orthogonal line no why do you have... why no why do you need that perpendicular you don't need that perpendicular here right uh, i mean i just wanted to explain these are two dimensions right so we have two pcs no. pc1 and pc2 when you have just two features you don't need hmm. why do you need the second dimension no 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 just to show that this will be second no, dimension no. let's 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 forget the second dimension let's okay. just focus on one dimension okay, okay. the our objective is we want to reduce two dimensions to one dimension correct mm, correct so there's no question of this dimension coming into picture so let's forget that perpendicular line let's just focus on this line mm. what okay. you call a size hat or size yeah. dash or whatever mm. so what does that represent now this is the this is our principal component now okay why is this a principal component this is principal component because i will show this i mean this is another data just i just wanted to show this so here what happens let's no, say no. this is let, the let's data. not complicate it uh, sirish mm. just go back okay. to that okay uh, no you, can you can you go to that uh, if you don't mind mm. which one uh, there was a pdf that you shared a while back right mm. yeah, just one. Mm. Yeah, just crawl down just crawl down okay just crawl down yeah yeah yeah, the, yeah this image the second one from the top mm. all right mm. okay yes, i'll i'll just stop you mm. so so folks so what's happening here is so you have those orange crosses that's the data point each data point is a combination of number of rooms and size right now as we it's again let's say going back to the math physics example let's say one dimension is math and the other is physics so each point is your scores in math and physics now when you look at these data points here don't you see that there is a clear pattern in this case it's a pattern between the number of rooms and size but let's replace number of rooms and size with math scores and physics scores you see a pattern there and what is that pattern can anybody say let's let's just replace number of rooms with math and size with physics anyone in the audience if you look at this what is that pattern that you see by just looking at by just eyeballing those data points those orange points what is the pattern that you see anyone this time i'm opening it to all there's a positive correlation exactly there's a positive correlation which means higher the math scores higher the physics scores you see that very clearly right of course this in this problem we're talking of number of rooms and size but the idea is when you have such a correlation why not just compress the whole thing into one single dimension why do you need two dimensions it's again going back and saying look if i have to figure somebody is smart and if i know that somebody who scores well in math also scores well in physics why do i need to have two dimensions let me have one single dimension which is an amalgamated dimension of math and physics and i'm happy i'm sufficient but but when we do that we lose certain information so which means so if you look at that star you know when when you if you take one star here just take one orange star all right that star already when you mark a star you're marking this star on a two dimensional graph right where you have number of rooms and size so you mark that point now when it is one dimension you don't have number of rooms you don't have size all that you have is that nice yellow line called size hat right so what will happen to that star now this nice little kutti star there 
the the orange one where will that go now abhinav or sandhya or kailvedi it will get projected exactly to that size size one line correct why because it has to go somewhere right the the star existed because you had two dimensions you had a number of rooms dimension you had a size dimension so you you had a graph paper you could you could put that kutti pulli on the graph paper no problems there but then now that you've reduced it to one dimension which is size hat then the then that star the the orange color star has to go to the size hat there's no option which is which is what is shown by the dotted line there you see that against each of those stars as a dotted line hitting the size size hat line which is like saying look eventually the star will move to the size line to that dimension all right now of course when you do that no somebody is can you stay on mute please thank you uh but when you do that you're losing some information don't you see that right earlier you had number of rooms you had size you 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 marked that point on that graph but that point doesn't exist anymore it has moved to the size one line which means you've lost some information maybe it is not a big loss but you have lost some information all right so so the point is you have this new nice feature called size one which is an amalgamation of number of rooms and size you have all your points now marked on size hat which is a new feature but in the process you would have lost some information why because you've reduced the dimension right so there could be some information somewhere you would have lost it but then in the grand scheme of things maybe it doesn't matter all right so let's be very clear reducing the dimensions is useful but you also lose information keep that in mind nothing comes free of cost folks all right but <clears throat> the overall scheme of things it is fine all right now the whole mathematics behind this the whole mathematics that helps us determine what precisely is the size hat line goes to determining what is called as eigen vectors we'll come to that later when we do linear algebra we'll do eigen values and eigen vectors but these are words that you might have you know heard when you did some linear algebra at college so it is the eigen vector and the eigen value that will allow us to precisely say this line is size hat all right just to extend the conversation further <clears throat> this was two dimensions so we reduced it to one let us say you have more dimensions let's say three dimensions that you wish to reduce to two so the way it will work is it will determine the size hat this is one dimension then tca will also determine another dimension which will be perpendicular to size hat which is what they're showing there you see there's another another dimension there which is perpendicular to size hat okay so what pca will do is it will come up with these dimensions each one of them being perpendicular to the other all right why should it be perpendicular because the idea is when you are it's like it's like look no okay i i will explain this mm -hmm. go ahead it should be perpendicular because see if we consider any other line right it will be parallel again it will have covariance right both will be related so another have... another intuitive way of looking at it is i mean let's if you go to that example right i mean english and mathematics right english and maths will be perpendicular <laughs> why mm -hmm. because there won't be any covariance between english scores and generally i'm saying you know unless there is an underlying intelligence that 
you know ensures that you you score well in english as well as mathematics english scores and math scores may not be correlated so <clears throat> so while unearthing features what pca does is it it calculate or rather it extracts a feature which in this case is size one that's the first feature then it extracts another feature which is perpendicular or the term is orthogonal orthogonal right that's the linear algebraical term but let's use the word perpendicular for the time being because we haven't dealt with that aspect of linear algebra yet so that's what pca does now the next question that you have to think about is will it keep doing this forever so let us say i had 50 dimensions initially all right and i keep doing this pca and again pca gives me 50 dimensions then the question is what is the point in doing all this right because the whole idea of doing pca is to reduce the dimension now, but what i am saying is look i start with size hat then pca gives me another dimension which is perpendicular to size hat maybe pca will give me another dimension which is perpendicular to both so on and so forth and if it keeps giving me all those new dimensions and if it just turns out that I get 50 dimensions, I start the problem with 50 dimensions and PCA gives me another 50, then what is the point in doing PCA? So which means we need to know when to stop doing PCA. There is a point in time where we say enough is enough. I've had enough. I don't want to do any more PCA stuff. We stop. All right. So there is a way to stop it. Okay. Uh, and to explain how, you know, what exactly we do to stop it, what Sirisha would do is she'll take an example of an image, uh, a grayscale image, which is compressed using PCA technique and where we reduce the features from, is it 1900, uh, Sirisha? Right? Yeah, I think so. It's around 1200 or so. Yeah, 1200 or 1900, one of those. To about what? How many? Maybe about yeah. 50, is it? 55, 60 or something like that, right? Yeah, 32, I think. Yeah, whatever. Because go ahead. After go I ahead downloaded, and... right, dimensions changed actually. Okay, all right. So go ahead and show us what exactly is that. Yeah. And uh, just one more thing I wanted to add, VC. I mean, if I mean, if you go for PCA, right? Uh, we will identify different principal components, right? Out of which the principal component one will be like the 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 line which gives that has more variance in the sense it it has more spread or more information. And okay, after now that... okay, I'll, I'll just stop you. It's not a question for you. Okay, it's a question for the audience. Doesn't that sound very counterintuitive? So what Sirisha is saying is this particular line will have maximum variance. I mean, all this while we've been working with cost functions and blah, blah, blah. And our objective always has been to reduce the, you know, the, the cost function. But now we are saying we want to maximize the variance. <laughs> Anyone? Why? What do we mean? Just, just stop, just stop there, Sirisha. I want people to look at this and then and tell me why are we looking at maximum variance and saying we need that maximum variance. Why are we saying that? What is the intuition behind it? Actually, here in this case, we need more both the information, the size and the number of them. That's right. So why maximum variance in the data? So that's how it works. Max, when there is a maximum variance, then it says with changing every small amount, we get large amount of how the both the variables change. Okay, let me ask this question. Okay. The size is a the size hat is a line, correct? All right. Yeah, yeah. Somebody is speaking. I don't know who it is, but it's not very 
<clears throat> Can you mute yourself, please? Because you're not audible. Or maybe it's up. Maybe it's Abhinav. Up. Yeah. Thank you. So let's say this high size hat. It's a line. It's a nice looking line. Let's say instead of that being a line, let us say it is a point. All right. Let us say everything can. Let's say it's this point somewhere in the center where every single data point is projected to a single point instead of being projected on a line. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? Let us say it's a very hypothetical question. Is that what you want? Instead of, so you have size hat being a line where every data point is projected on that line. But let's say instead of size hat being a line, it is a point and every data point around it is projected into that point and nothing else, which means at the end of this whole exercise, all that you will see is one single point. Why? Because you don't have that line anymore. You just have that one single point. Is that what you wish to see? Abhina, would you want to see that? How could it happen? Sorry? <laughs> Two dimensions. No, I said hypothetical. So, hypothetical. No. Let us say you reduce it to one single point. Would you want to see that? You wouldn't want. You wouldn't want to. Why? Because I mean, you have to go on mute because I think it is you. You when you you when your microphone is on, I think uh, my voice echoes because when you when you compress everything to one single point, you have lost all data. Correct. So the objective is you have the you have data with you and there is variance in the data, isn't it? You see that? There is data and there is a variety in that data. And when you project it to this new axis, you want to capture that variety of you know, whatever variety that is there in the data, you want to capture that. You don't want to lose that. If you compress everything to one single point, you've lost everything. And you can't do any further analysis on top of that. So which is why we look for maximum variance in the sense we're saying we are at, when, when we have this line called size hat, it, and then you have all these data points projected on size hat, it has to capture the variance that is there in the data. So it's, it's, like, it's like saying, look, there is some variety in the data. Yes, I have compressed it by moving everything to size hat, but I have managed to capture the variety. Right? Kind of somehow I managed both. That's what size hat does here. It manages to capture that variety and also reduce the dimension. Okay. Sirisha, go ahead. Yeah. So that is what we have to capture maximum information we we should not lose information that is why uh, we will look for the principal component which has more variance more variance is nothing but more spread of data which means we, it has more information okay so the one which has more information is going to be pc1 the next more information or the next one the principal component which has variance will be your pc2 it will be like that okay that is one more thing I want to highlight. Now, oh, one minute. So here, for example, right? If you see this, right? This is the spread of data. And if you see, there is one purple line, right? This one, this one. So this line will be considered as PC1 because this has more variance. Variance means, I mean, when these uh, blue points are projected onto this purple line, right? The spread from origin is more. I mean, that is how we calculate variance, right? So this line will have maximum variance and that will be PC1. Uh, now, uh, we see I'll directly jump there. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So mathematical intuition we'll discuss when we discuss about linear algebra. Now, I just wanted to show this. So what are we trying to do here? Here, we are trying to compress the image. See, uh, one application of PCA is image compression. Okay. 
what what do uh, i mean let's say we have image or we we use whatsapp right uh, we have images in our uh, mobile like we send images over the bandwidth so what happens when we send that information if the size of image is big right what will happen it requires more bandwidth and again it is a performance hit okay so what happens in this case one application of pca is image compression so what happens when we send an image or transfer the image right we will compress that image send over that and once the image is sent to the target person right there again we can decompress decompress the image and then show the image that is how actually everything works whatever whatsapp or instagram or whatever we have right where we send the data this is how it works because we have to use bandwidth efficiently so that is what that is what exactly we do i mean while transferring the image and all so that is one of the application of pca so here if you see right i've taken just this image and uh, i i mean i i wanted to explain one more thing here if you see this right this is a color image one minute let me show this these are the dimensions of the image uh see uh dimension means the shape right the shape of the image gives the dimensions dimension is nothing but the spread of the image i will show one more thing right this one okay now what happens if we have to read a image in a system or whatever it is it will be read something like this it will be read as matrix in the computer okay out of which the columns represent the features and the uh, this thing the rows are there right this represents pixels these are all my features and this is the pixel information i mean if it is uh, rgb right each i mean if it is a colorful image each uh, color will have different pixel right so that is what will be represented in this matrix and the columns represent features what exactly features i mean it is like dividing the image into rows and columns let's say that cat image is there right whenever i feed into my system it will read like this in this matrix format this rows is there right uh, let me show you see now here 470 is there right this represents height height is nothing but it it will have the pixel related information and uh, 626 is there right this will be the width width is nothing but the number of columns or the number of features which are there in this image so this is the dimension of the original image now what happens is uh, i mean if it is color image right it will have three dimensions r g v i think red green r g b blue r g b yeah these are our uh, this thing principal colors right if we mix these colors we will get other colors so this r g b is there right it will it will be three dimensional so it will have three things uh, i mean the channels will be three in case of rgb if we convert into gray scale gray scale is nothing but black and white image okay if we see this black and white image right it will have two values so that is a 0 and 1 1 is white and 0 is black okay But this is no this is gray scale so which means it it will be any value between 0 to 1 correct mm. it's gray scale is, yeah. it's a gray scale so which means white would be one mm, zero would black. be black and then there is a there is a you know it changes right it's not it's not a pakka black and this black and white uh, no correct, it's gray correct. scale right it's gray scale image so here i mean for i mean we can also compress color images also okay but uh, i mean that is also there but i have taken this sample where uh, i have converted this uh, color to gray so scale. so the idea is folks just to make sure that you have a two dimensional matrix nothing else yeah right correct so now what is the four in that pen yeah i don't know what is that four what is that four sirisha on top which one on top when you ran it i don't know where how you got that four which four Four seventy six twenty six and four. Uh, no, actually, it should be 
three. Right. Because why it will it? have three channels, right? Correct. I don't know why they're showing four. Uh, not sure. It should be three actually. It should. It is RGB, right? Yeah, I should. You should see only three. I don't know why we are seeing four there. Okay, let's ignore that and just proceed. Yeah, I'll just get back to you on that. Okay. Ideally, it should be three. Now I have projected to grayscale and these are the dimensions. Now I have taken the shape. Now uh, I'm I'm again we are using PCA to fit this image. After this image is fit right. Uh, let me run this. I'm sorry. I think I'm not running this. <coughs> After that, I'm fitting this image using this uh, PCA and we are calculating the variance. All right, let me yeah, just show the graph. Can you just scroll down? Yeah. yeah, just stop there. Just scroll down a little bit more. All right, just stop there. So essentially, right? So the way to look at it is imagine an image Think of the image being split into multiple columns. So, you know, think of an image split into multiple columns. So there are about, say, a few thousand columns because that's how it is, right? When you look at image, given that, uh, it, you know, the area of the pixel is very, very small. Just imagine a thousand odd columns, okay? that imagine each of those columns to be features all right now and then you run the pca algorithm and what pca algorithm does is it it tries to identify the principle so it's it's again goes back to that maths physics chemistry example where you have math is a feature Physics was a feature. Let's say English is a feature. And then you run the PCA algorithm. A PCA algorithm will come back and tell us, forget the features that you gave us. I have a new bunch of features. All right. Now, if in the input you had, say, 1,000 features. Now, objective here is, at the end, you don't want to see 1,000 features. You want to see far less, right? Because that's the whole idea of dimensionality reduction. So you want to see far less number of features, but you also want to capture the variety in the data. So you want to do both. As they say in Tamil, right? You want to do both. So what this nice look, looking chart it's called what is it called scar plot is it or something like that right yes yeah scar plot if i'm right what this tells you is to the to the x-axis you have think of this as the the features the new set of features that pca throws at you and the y-axis has no no just scroll down just scroll down scroll down has a cumulative variance which means you remember what we are saying? We want to explain the variant, the most of the variance of the data. So it's like saying, look, as an as I keep adding the features, I'm able to explain more variance of the data. I come to a point where I've kind of explained almost 95% of the variance. So this particular point, maybe I think it's about 50 odd features if I'm right. So if I've reached 50 odd features. I have already captured 95% of the variance. Now I can continue. I can continue increasing the number of features. But if you look at it, the percentage of or rather the cumulative explained variance, it tapers off after some time, right? There's a steep rise. I reach the 95% mark pretty quickly. 
but after that point it kind of tapers so i take a judgment call and i say okay i have i have explained 95% of the variance in the input data using just about 54 features the input data had some thousands of maybe 1500 features and just 54 was enough i stopped there and i used those 54 features to redraw that image again because remember folks the original image had a lot of columns why because that's what a typical image is. So if, it, if an image, image has, say, 32 cross 32, if that's the dimension, then there are 32 columns in the input image. If the image is, say, 640 cross 640, then there are 640 columns in the input image. Now, after doing PCA, I'm saying, look, I'm happy with 54. So which means I've reduced the number of columns. So the next step that I'm going to do is I'll have to redraw or rather recreate the image original image again using a reduced set of features have we done that uh, sirisha yes we see I'll show. so do we have that can you show yeah, us yeah yeah so this is the one i mean initially if we see this length right this is 470 so we have 470 features out of which right we don't need all these if we see the graph right it is very clear like it is actually less than 50 also like the here itself we are getting 95 percent of the variance which means we will have 95 percent of the information so here what i what we will do now is we will run the pca okay now here uh, is this a recreated image now using using the number of yeah principal components but how many have you used to recreate uh, the image oh one minute Incremental. 32 is it? Yeah, first 32. And where does it? Where do you mention it is 32? Uh, no, one. Ten, ah, this is useful. Ten, I think the yeah, one below is useful. useful. Yeah. So here, right? Exactly what I've done is, uh, minute, it will generate again. So here, uh, this is run with different uh, K values. Uh, sorry, with different PCs. One is 10, the other one is 25, number of components actually. By taking 10 components, 25, 50, 100. So if you see this, right, and if you plot this image, see with 10 components, it is blurred, not clear. At 25, yes, it is a bit okay. But 50 itself, at 50 itself, like we are able to identify, right? There is a pillow here, there is a bed, and uh, there are two cats. So, I mean... 50 features actually are sufficient to explain this and we need not uh, require all the okay so features. yeah so 50 and then you have 100 150 250 so if you look at folks if you look at the image where the components is 100 150 and 250 you see that there isn't much to choose between them if you just look at the graph that we saw a while back can you just take us to the graph again if you don't mind yeah the graph the scar plot. Yeah, if you look at it, and if you look at the principal components, at about 50-ish, we've already explained 95% of the variance of the input image. And if you see, it has tapered off. So which is why you might increase the number of principal components, but it may not add value to the cumulative variance, which is what you can see here as well, because you start, you know, the moment you reach 50, even from 50 to 100, there isn't much of a difference. But then beyond that, there's nothing that our eyes can discern. That's very important because objective of the objective of these images is for people to see. So beyond a point, there isn't something that I mean, our, our eyes cannot discern between the one where the components is 100 and the one where the components, components is 250. All right. So essentially, you you would probably choose to stop at maybe 50 or, you know, worst case, 100. And then that image is your compressed image. So less number of features. So which means 
less number of data points from a storage perspective. So which means when you pass it through a, through a communication channel, you're not going to pass all those pixels. You don't need to. Assuming the image is a grayscale image, okay? Don't forget about colors. Let's assume the input image was a grayscale image like this. And you want to pass through a communication channel, then you don't need to pass every single pixel. We can what PC allows you to do is it allows you allows you to reduce the number of features, which means reduce the number of pixels that you're going to send, which also means reduce the size of the image, image. that's passed through the communication channel. Yeah. I'll stop here. Yeah. Folks, questions. Uh, we see uh, the, the process basically uh, reducing the size of the image. Uh, can we compare the original size and the, the size in the image that you have generated? How much difference it will be? Yes, actually, I did that. That is what actually I'm checking here. Uh, it's not there. Let me show one more example. I mean, it is handy. That is why I'm not. I'm, I'm showing you this. Okay. Uh, let me run this. This is one more image, okay. This is again colorful image. I'll show you the reduction in size also. I think I printed the values. See, compressed size is uh, 8 to 29. Size is nothing but the number of features reduced, right? That will be equal to, uh, I mean, the number of PCS. I mean, similar example. If you see this. What was the here? original... Size. Oh, oh, wait one minute. Let me show you the original size I printed. This is uh yeah thousand, after thousand. grayscale conversion it is thousand okay. From that six sixty seven to thousand after applying PCA this is converted into six sixty seven eight six sixty seven twenty nine. This eight twenty nine this is nothing but our PCA PCA components. How many we right, have just crawled down just crawled down yeah okay so here uh Sanjay. So the first image is 669,8. That's the size, right? The second one is six, sorry, 667,8. The second one is 667,29, 667,73. Uh, Sirisha, can you just scroll a little above? Where do we hit the 95% mark? Yeah, by, by the time we are close to 100, we've already hit the 95% mark, correct? Correct. Here, right? here. Yeah, here. So little less than hundred. We are already hitting yeah, the ninety-five percent mark. Than 100, yeah. So I think, even, yeah, at seventy-three itself, you can the image yeah, looks pretty decent. Clear. Yeah, pretty decent, isn't it? Mm, mm. So, so that's your. So, so the size of that image would be six sixty-seven comma seventy-three. Is that clear, Sanjay? Yeah. yeah yes, please. And then, uh, how do you tell this? Is it chat GPT or the... No, 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 not chat GPT actually. Uh, I've gone through, I mean, myself and uh, VC, we have gone through different websites, and after that, from that, we got the data. And I tried this. you uh, chat GPT should also work, it's just that we didn't try chat GPT, yeah. but I'm pretty sure, pretty <laughs> sure work. chat GPT should work as well, mm. just that we didn't try. You can you can try, folks. You know, it's not the, the code is readily available. We'll also share the code. You can try punching some images and then play around with PCA and see. There are a variety of there's so many. You know, image compression is just one application. That's not the only application. There's several other applications. In fact, we use PCA extensively in finance and investments. So, sorry, say that again, Abhinav. One thing I did it in came in testing. Uh, for example, you have multi dimension. So, uh, to visualize how the came in algorithm is working, and, uh, you did final... PCA? Did you do PCA? Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. at that time, to visualize it. All right. Okay. So, Any other questions, folks? And one more thing I want to highlight here. Okay. Here, if you see, right, whatever I'm printing here, if you want to see the image, right, I have to decompress it. 
PCA, right? It will not have any valid information. It is linear combination of other features. So if you want to see that, I mean, it will not be, I mean, uh, this thing. So here, what we have to do is we have to uh, apply inverse transformation and then only we can see the image. We can print the image. Right. Okay. Okay. So what you're saying is you take the features. So it's like we we had the image. We we went to the features. Now it's like from features, you go back to the inverse image. transform. It's yeah. an inverse transform. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then only we can see. Otherwise, uh, we cannot see that because that is not valid. I mean, I mean, visually, it's not the thing. All right. So here I have uh, printed size after compression. So this is the, it, I mean, basically what we do when we transfer the information, right? We will send this compressed image. Along with that, we will send uh, the PCA components, which we have done. Okay. So that at the target end, they will do the reverse process and get the original image. Mm -hmm. That is how actually it happens. All right. Yeah. yeah okay, okay. Okay. All right. Oh, so basically, okay. So it's, you make a very interesting point. How many of you understood that? So what Sirisha is saying is, if I have to send this information through a communication channel, I'll send the image, but is that sufficient? Sirisha, are mm -hmm. we sending the image or what are we sending? Along with this compressed image, right? We have to send the metadata also. Metadata in the sense, the number of components so that the reverse engineering will happen and we can get the original image from the decompressed image. We will go apply reverse PC and get the original image. Okay. All right. Yeah, I actually that is also there, but I did not add here because that way that may be too. Okay. Confusing, all right. You know? Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's not confuse people even more. Okay, mm -hmm. folks, we're going to stop here, but we, we would like to here if there are any questions. I'm not going to bore you with linear algebra today, given that PCA itself is a reasonably heavy topic. But I'll, I'll stop here for questions. Feel free to ask uh, them. I do have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. So in PCA, uh, uh, so Tisha Madam mentioned that initially we are, uh, you know, compressing the image. Okay. So, and then we are actually decompressing the image. So do we lose any information you would, during this process? You would. You would. Why? That's because, okay. So Sirisha, just show us that uh, that panel with eight images. Where is that? Yeah. Yeah. Just crawl down. Yeah. Stop there. A little bit. Yeah. So let's say hypothetically, see, there are eight different, sorry, six different images here. Each one with a certain number of features. The original image had 470 features. Now, if I choose, let's say the one with 73 features, to the naked eye, it looks okay. But then there could be some minor thing in that image that may not be captured when you when you have 73 features. Maybe it is important, maybe it isn't important. It depends, right? It depends on the application. Don't you see that? If the application demands that the, the resolution should be higher, then of course you have to look at, you have to consider more features while transmitting, right? But if the application doesn't demand that, if it's just a question of merely figuring out that this looks like a, a harbor with a bunch of boats and there's some background and you're not particularly concerned about clarity, then 73 is sufficient. It, it does what we expect from the algorithm, right? So yes, you do lose information. You can clearly see between 73 and original. Don't you see the difference in clarity, Sabarish? Uh, yes, I see. You see that, right? Even, even the naked yes. eye can detect it. But the question is, do you need that clarity? 
no uh, we see while transmitting we will send with pca 73 but while we restore the image right we will get back original image no, no, you won't no, no, you won't you won't you won't you won't <laughs> how will you get back the original one you cannot that is also a just think about it yeah you cannot right if you if you have to get the original then i'll have to send all features No, no, no. Along with this, right? We will send metadata, right? So That's using right. that, we can do reverse engineering, and we can get then, that original image is what I at least uh, understood. But Or if, what I studied. If... No, let's revisit that aspect. Okay. Okay. Mm. I'm not very certain whether you'll get the exact original image with mm. the same resolution. Mm. I doubt. Let's let's check that. Okay, because mm. then it. I mean, it 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 defeats. That's like a hundred percent perfect communication channel, right? You haven't lost any information at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's possible. Be, think think logically. Whenever you do any compression, you are going to lose some information. It's just that that loss isn't particularly important. So let's revisit that statement. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I don't think that's happening. You're not going to get that original, paka resolved. I mean, that resolution. You're not going to get it again, right? But as I said, just let's probe further to be absolutely sure. Sabari, did you did you get did you did you get an answer to your question? Uh, yes, we see. Uh, I got the answer, but I am little confused. Like when Ma'am said, like uh, we will share metadata and we will be able to extract that original. Uh, exactly. Uh, okay, again, that I, is where I am little confused. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think you would get that original image in the same resolution. I don't think that will happen. We'll come back to you on that. What exactly you'll get at the other end of the communication channel? All right. But forget communication. Let's let's not even talk about communication now. Okay. let's throw communication to the dustbin we are compressing an image so that it occupies less space let's put it that way so don't you see there was an original image which was compressed and the number of features is 73 and this does a reasonable job of representing the original image which had about 470 features or something like that would you agree to that ah uh, yes yes all right i think that's sufficient for this session we need to probe further to precisely know what exactly is passed through a communication channel if you have to pass this image what exactly is passed is something that i think we'll have to probe a little further others on the call would you have any questions all right if there isn't any we'll stop for the day strong recommendation um go through the linear algebra stuff again pca goes to give me uh, give me i'm not going to bore you give me a moment let me just share my screen i'll just take a minute or two i hope i have it with me give me a sec folks what this was the let me see if i have the ah yeah exactly we have it You see the second thing. Look at this. Large classes of engineering problems, no matter how huge, can be reduced to two problems in linear algebra. A x is equal to b, or A x is equal to lambda x. All this while, when we were discussing linear algebra, we were looking at A x equal to b. Sometimes b was zero. What we call as homogeneous systems. of linear equations or on the, uh, the homogeneous system of linear equations the second bit ax is equal to lambda x is another class of linear algebraical problems and uh, 
interestingly, PCA, the pro PCA problem can be reduced to an AX is equal to lambda X. And if you solve this, you would get what is called as eigenvectors. And each of the eigenvector is the extracted feature. So if Sirisha, can, can you just share your screen for a moment and, and just show us that image where you had 73. Are you sharing, Sirisha? I think you have to stop sharing. All right, sorry. Go ahead, can you share? Just share. So when you say PCA is equal to seven to three, what it does is you will get 73 eigenvectors when you solve AX is equal to lambda X. You'll get more, but you pick only 73. In fact, you'll get on maybe 400, 500 eigenvectors, let's say. But you'll pick the seven, you'll pick 73 and um, that's your, each eigenvector is your new extracted feature. So the reason I brought this up is, should you want to know what's happening behind the scenes? We need to get to the stage where we understand eigenvectors. That comes a little later. But to get there, we need to understand some basic problems, which is the problems that we were discussing. AX is equal to B. So let's be very well versed with AX is equal to B kind of problems so that when we move to AX is equal to lambda X, the transition is easy. All right. Uh, any questions? I'll wait for a short while to hear if there are any questions. Any? Uh, we see. Yep. Vasavi, go ahead. Is this like feature uh, extraction or uh, reduction since we lose some information? Mm. Is it okay. like to, it, it's synonymous. There is something called as feature selection and there is feature extraction. Two things, right? Feature extraction involves reduction of features. Mm -hmm. So whenever we, we, again, let's go to that math and physics example. Math was a feature. Physics was a feature. And let's say you do feature extraction, which combines math and physics into one single feature. So you have done feature extraction, but it's feature reduction too. Why? Because earlier you had math and physics. Now you have one feature, which is an amalgamated feature of math and physics. Right? So feature extraction and feature reduction are synonymous. Okay. Right? Got it? The other one is feature selection, where you choose to ignore math. Maybe just take physics or alternatively, ignore physics, take math. That's feature selection. We're not talking of selection. PCA is feature extraction, which is done by which is done through essentially reduction in the number of dimensions or reduction in the number of features. Right? Anyone else? So in feature selection, uh, we will omit the feature, right? Exactly, correct. You pick and choose. So you will you'll run some complex correlation between various features and say, okay, this is correlated. Math and physics is correlated. I don't need math. I'll throw math. I'll have physics. Physics and English is not correlated. Let me retain both of them because they're, they're entirely different. So let me retain both of them. Something like that. So that will be feature selection, right? This is feature extraction, which means you didn't see that feature. None of us saw that feature. In this particular case, there was an image which had four, 470 features. What PCA allows us to do is it saw certain features and it's saying, look, with 73, I can solve your problem. With just 73 features, I can just ensure that, you know, the image can be transmitted. 
we don't need 470 features. That's what PCA is trying to tell us, right? So that's feature extraction, which is a which is done through the process of feature reduction, right? So they go together. Anyone else? Uh, I have a doubt, BC. Go ahead. So in the problem, we are uh, we saw in the first uh, the price of a house. So we extract the uh, uh, data of uh, size and rooms, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't use the future selection. We use the future extraction. We extract the Correct. data from the existing value. Correct. That is right. Correct. So, so that's the difference between PCA uh, is all about feature extraction. Yeah. PCA means yeah, feature you, even extraction. Even there, you're right, uh, Kanmani. So mm -hmm. there you had size and rooms, number of rooms number of rooms that we have projected and, on yeah, your different way. Yeah. So you had two dimensions, two features. So that One. particular line, the size hat line, was an entirely new feature. So it's feature extraction, evidently. But it is also feature reduction because you started with two features. But eventually, you're going to work with one feature, which is a size hat feature. Feature extraction and dimensionality reduction, both are same. Both are same. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Feature selection is features, different. Uh, yeah. Feature Future selection is different. Is different. different. There, Correct. you will ignore features. But yeah. Feature but it'll be, if you go to that size, uh, that example, feature selection would be very silly, isn't it? There are two uh -huh. features. <laughs> if, you, if you remove one of them, it's an extremely silly thing to do, right? So you would not do a feature selection when you have just two features. You will retain both of them. But then feature extraction is something that you can work with. Why? Because it's going to come up with this new nice feature that amalgamates both features together, does dimensionality reduction, and, and it's sufficiently good enough for our analysis. Yeah, got it. Thanks, Lucy. Perfect. Wonderful. All right, folks. So, if there's anything, if there isn't anything else. Let's. Uh... So, uh, feature, ex feature extraction, damage and reduction, the feature reduction. They're, they're all the same. They're all the same. They all, all the mean same. the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, feature dimensions are all the same, you know, used very synonymously. So, don't. Right. Okay. Uh, so, we'll stop for the day. Uh, we'll continue on Wednesday. Uh, have a good night. See you. Thank you. Bye.